Hello everyone, SimCFI here. This video is going to cover departure procedures, or DPs, and standard terminal arrivals, or STARS. A uh, key note is that SIDS, for standard instrument departure, is technically an older term. Departure procedure is the new term, but you'll still hear everyone refer to departure procedures as SIDS, S-I-D. So, a departure procedure is a method of controlling the traffic out of a busier airport, like uh, SAC International here, and uh, it can also, you know, it'll it'll obviously keep you clear of terrain. Sometimes they'll have departure procedures specifically designed to do that, such as an obstacle departure procedure. But at other rate, it's a method method of controlling the traffic, leaving the terminal environment, and it connects you with the en route environment. And so what you do is you find, at the end of the route, you find where these points are on your route, and you just piece them together. You usually have a, a departure segment, an en route segment, an arrival segment, and then your instrument approach segments of, the, uh, of your instrument flight, and you just have to connect all those pieces together, and you have a completed flight plan. So you have to have these uh, departure procedures here either in the text format down here below or in this uh, graphical format to fly the route. You can't legally accept and fly this departure procedure unless you have the, the play here basically. And you can find these by uh, you know go on Sky Vector at least go to the airport I have the the weather icons on so you can just click on that click on your airport and you scroll down until you start seeing all these PDFs. So you have weather minimums, we'll go over that later. Here's your standard terminal arrival charts, so all your arrival procedures. Here's your instrument approach procedure charts, so your ILSs and all that. And then here's your departure procedure charts. See they have uh, DP, not SID. So here's your departure procedures. So you can find them here, or you can get them on ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or other uh, pilot apps for tablets and whatnot. However you end up getting them, you gotta have the plate. And so some examples, this is the uh, the Frogo 6 departure out of Sacramento International, SMF. And just like with the instrument approach how we talked about in our first video, the, the primary course is the heavy black arrows. So you see it departs the runways either on runway 3, 4, or 1, 6. You follow those black lines through the intersections until it stops. And so this one, the standard departure, takes you to Frogo intersection. And then there's one transition. You can t have it take you down to Friant Vortac as a transition. So they describe it down here. If you're taking off runway 16 left and right, I'll zoom in. Then you're going to maintain runway heading until 600 feet. That's here. Then turn left heading 120 degrees to intercept and proceed via the Sacramento 090 radio to Frogo intersection. So we turn left to 120, intercept the Sacramento 090 radio, fly that to Frogo intersection. So we have to be able to identify Frogo intersection. We can identify it via DME, so we have 24 miles to Thorn and 43 miles all the way to Frogo or you can identify it with the Manteca uh, 027 radio. So you get two radios that'll make a fix or radio and the DME that makes a fix. So we identify Frogo. Then via the transition to Friant or to your assigned route. Expect further clearance to filed altitude after Thorn intersection. So sometimes, you know, if you're, especially in a larger aircraft, you know, like your airliners, you typically see them get cleared up to just a few thousand feet, and then later on they'll get cleared up to higher altitudes. So this is saying you can expect that further clearance to higher altitude at Thorn intersection. Now, if you're taking off runway 34 left or right, that's going northbound. You see you're going to maintain runway heading until 1500 feet, then turn right heading 140 to intercept the Marysville 154 radial. So climb straight ahead to 1500, right turn to heading 140. You see that gets you a good intercept angle to the 154 radial off of the Marysville VOR. Alrighty, well now we continue reading. Intercept and proceed via the Marysville 154 to Liam intersection, that's right here. 
Then turn left heading 120 to intercept that same Sacramento 090 to Frogo, so we meet up again down here. Then via the transition or your assigned route, expect further clearance of held altitude after Liam. Okay, so what if you lose your radios and get lost communications? So if you're taking off runways 3, 4, left and right, you're going to maintain runway heading until 1500. Looks like the same procedure. Then resume own navigation. And we'll be talking about what you do for lost communications for the rest of the IFR flight in a later video. But basically, you're trying to be predictable. So there's one transition with this, with this departure procedure. And they have the text down here, the Friant transition from over Frogo intersection via the Friant 306 radial. You take that to Friant Vortac. So essentially just direct to Friant after that. And that's the 306 radial, so you have to reverse that and it's going to be like a 1-2 something. Mental math. Um, but you find the inverse, you find that bearing inbound to Friant Vortac. Okay, again you have your uh, current times, your current your valid period on the chart here. Here's some frequencies, here's clearance delivery, NorCal departure control, and you got some different frequencies for different uh, directions of flight. But otherwise that, that's pretty much it. Okay, so now let's take a look at another departure procedure. This one is um, I think one of the newer ones. So they have this, this new procedure called climb via and descend via where um, to make things simple they just tell you to climb via the Rita 5 departure and you follow a bunch of altitude restrictions until you get up to the top altitude of 16,000 feet. So let's say we're going to depart uh, one of these runways and so basically it's saying that once we depart here you uh, you climb up to 600 feet and then you have to use your RNAV, so in this case a GPS basically, to navigate direct to TAPS intersection and you see the line over the 4,000 so we have to cross TAPS at or below 4,000 feet and then when we get to bottle we have to be uh, at or below 500 feet. Once we get to Flyza uh, we have to be at or above 7,000 feet. The line is underneath. So basically you can, you know, if you're flying a, a big jet, you can just fly to your, your your top altitude. You can set the top altitude right away. So once you get to Flyza, um, you can just set 16,000 and take it all the way up to 16,000 because then up to uh, above 9,000, above 10,000, and then depending on which uh, transition you're breaking off on, you see how the solid black line ends at Rita, hence the Rita 5 departure. And so you got some transitions. And uh, and so these numbers up here, the 6500 and the 12000, these are minimum and rear altitudes during the procedure. So you can just go right up to 16000 at this point, but you have to at least be above these altitudes and you have to be below these altitudes. So if they say climb via the SID, then you take off and you just follow all these altitude transitions. Otherwise, if this if they say climb via the SID except maintain like 10,000, then that means you climb all the way up, but then you don't climb any higher than 10,000, as an example. Um, so the, these other departure procedures like this one, you know, they don't have all these altitude restrictions. You just have minimum uh, en route altitudes along the route, so you just have to maintain that. And so they don't necessarily issue you that same climb via uh, clearance on this one. They don't have the top altitude. It's not one of the newer procedures yet. And then uh, this is the textual version for the Rita 5. So you just you can read the text again here. All right. So let's take a look at this obstacle departure procedure. So. An obstacle departure procedure is really just to clear you of obstacles and terrain, not necessarily for the, the traffic flow. And so this one, you have your graphical right here, and you have your text up here. So if you're going to take off on runway 6, which is probably going this way, standard with minimum climb of 430 feet per nautical mile to 1,500 feet. Okay, so what are st what is standard so standard 
takeoff minimums, we have to get into the discussion of uh, Part 91, 135, and 121. So if you're just a private pilot, commercial pilot going for an instrument rating, then uh, you know, you're going to be doing that under Part 91, um, which is just general flying, uh, recreation flying, you could say. Um, Part 91 has no takeoff minimums. You can take off with zero visibility and zero ceiling, but it's not very smart because then you can't land with an instrument approach, uh, approach procedure. So for the airlines and charter flying, so airlines are covered under um, Federal Aviation Regulations Part 121, and uh, charter stuff is usually governed under Part 135. And so per 91, Part 91, 175 for a lot of these different parts 121 135 and a handful of others the standard takeoff minimums is going to be one statute mile visibility if you have two engines or less and it's a half mile uh, statute mile visibility if you have more than two engines and it's also a half mile half statute mile visibility for helicopters so that is the that is the standard takeoff weather minimums now Obviously, if you've if you've been flying on airliners, you know they they'll take off with less vid visibility. And what's happening in there is their company has um, essentially has approval to do so through some documents and whatnot. So, but we're not going to get into that. That's not the scope of this video. Um, and otherwise, standard can also mean this normal 200 foot per nautical mile climb gradient. And so anytime the climb gradient is not listed, you have to assume 200 feet per nautical mile. So obviously we don't have an instrument that reads in feet per nautical mile. We have feet per minute, so we have to convert. Now we can use a simple formula where you just take your ground speed times the feet per nautical mile and then divide it by 60. So let's say we're climbing at 80 knots in a 172. Assuming no wind or ground speed is going to be roughly 80, at least around sea level. And uh, multiply that by 430 feet per nautical mile, so 430. Divide that by 60, and we need to have 573 feet per minute. Now think about a 172 loaded up to maximum gross weight uh, on a hot day. Is it going to be able to do it? You have to check your performance charts. And so this this is where you really got to make sure you run these calculations real quick before you take off because otherwise you'll be in the cloud, you're not going to see the terrain, and you don't know what kind of clearance you got, especially if you don't have any modern GPS that shows you terrain. Okay, so we showed you how to do that. So you have to look at these. We got 430 uh, runways, one at left, one at right, just as standard. So the standard weather minimums apply and the standard 200, foot per, 200 feet per nautical mile applies. Uh, runway 24, you have to have 300 foot ceiling and a mile visibility or standard with minimum climb of 250 feet per nautical mile to 300 feet or alternatively with standard takeoff minimums and normal 200 foot per climb so standard takeoff must occur no later than 2,000 feet prior to the departure end of the runway that's what DER means and then you can read through the rest of the stuff um, so then uh, the description, taking off and run with six, one at left, one at right, turn right, direct, Skaggs Island Vortec, and then aircraft departing the Vortec on the 165 radial, climb on course. Everyone else, like if you go north, west, east, anywhere that's not 165 radial, you need to uh, you need to continue climbing on that 165 radial until you get to 3,000 feet and then you're going to make a right hand turn and fly back to Skaggs Island before proceeding on course. So that ensures you get enough altitude to clear the mountains that are around here because this is Napa County. Let's go to World VFR. Napa County is down here. And you can see there's some terrain around here. We have uh, 2,600 feet, 2,800 feet. And so this is the Skaggs Island vortex right down here. They're having you go south a little bit and get at least 3,000 feet get over the vortex and then leave and that kind of gets you clear of the terrain. So you see how that obstacle departure procedure works. Alrighty. Let's talk about arrival procedures. Now this is a very complicated one. So let's let's kind of break it down. But essentially um, you know we, we want to see where this 
These are all like transitions. These are all feeder routes and transitions that lead to Glen Rose Vortac. And you see this is the Glen Rose One Arrival. And so that is where your arrival procedure, your standard instrument arrival, work, uh, starts from. And so there's a second page to this, and this is where you get your heavy black line. See here, there's no heavy black arrows, but on this one there is, because starting from Glen Rose is where everyone comes together. Then you come in, then you go to the airport. So, you know, if you're starting at Wink Vortac, you know, you got to be at flight level 180, and uh, you coming down, you just keep following this heading, zero, the 071 radio, then here's your VOR changeover point, and so now you're now you're navigating direct to um, Tuscola VOR, and then from here you fly outbound on the 082 radio all the way to Glen Rose, and you have uh, different DMEs and different uh, intersections to step you down your altitudes, 4,000 MEAs. And you also see some of these uh, these little racetrack patterns. These are these are published holding patterns which they can use to uh, basically stack everybody up in case there's a lot of weather and we can't land at the airport and we'll be talking about holding procedures in another video as well. So essentially you follow all these routes, you read the notes, radar is required for this, here's your frequencies, check your check the valid dates. Okay, so let's go to the next page. We meet up at Glen Rose and then we come and we see some other notes here. So at at Curly intersection, if you're a turbojet landing south, you're going to expect to be at 11,000 feet and at 270 knots. And then you can ex uh, you want to be 250 knots down here, 220 knots here. You see the uh, the lines on top and bottom; those are speed restrictions for the the K is knots. So you can go through the description again. So if you take in the wink transition like we were at the beginning, from over wink to the zero the zero seven one radio and then two five four, so it's just talking you through all these turns basically. And then once you get to uh once you get to the gen vortac So once we get to Gen, then all aircraft from Gen on the the 038 radio, and then you got your different directions. So all I saw aircraft landing north to Booth intersection, to Isab Isabel intersection, depart heading 075. Expect radar vectors. So we have to find these. So here's Booth, and so if you're getting to Booth or Isabel, and you're landing at Dallas Fort Worth. If you're landing north, like on uh, three fours or something, some northern runway, you follow this. So depart heading 075. Then they, then they vector you to your final approach. Turbojets landing south. You read these instructions. Props landing south. You go to these one of these two intersections and depart heading 015 and take your radar vectors. So that's how they're starting to get you in. And then we'll be flying this kind of stuff in the simulator, but you know we have to do a lot of this ground school stuff to get it started. Alrighty, so that's that's uh, a more complicated arrival, so all the other arrivals should be uh, a lot simpler. So again, we can grab all these plates in here. We can look at another arrival. And it's just a matter of finding where you are, where you want to come in from, basically, and follow the arrows to the center point. So Cedar Creek is this Cedar Creek 8 arrival. These are all the transition routes. That's what it says next to the name. So these are your transition routes. You find it all the way through. And then uh, this is the rest of the procedure from there. So then you get your heavy black lines coming from Cedar Creek, and it feeds you into the airports. And you get some more notes, so props, prop aircraft landing Dallas-Fort Worth, 
expect this star, this arrival, only when Dallas-Fort Worth is landing north. When they're landing south, expect and or file the, the Jaeger star. So you always want to pay attention to the notes. Alrighty, so now another thing here I'll show you. We see it with this uh, Rita 5 departure. Anytime you see this T, uh, black triangle T with a white letter T, that means there's a alternate takeoff minimums or there's a uh, an obstacle departure procedure. So there is one for uh, Sacramento, California. And so you can get this on that same page. So when we got all of our plates, it's up here, takeoff minimums. Takeoff minimums will take you to the appropriate page for your area. So if we're looking at Sacramento, here's Sacramento International. So we have a uh, departure procedure. This is your obstacle departure procedure. Runway 16 left, climb heading 164 to 700 before turning east. And then they give, there's a lot of notes. It tells you where, so you've got vehicles on road, 225 feet from departure end of runway, crossing runway center line, 10 feet above ground level, which is 31 feet above mean sea level. So basically telling you after you take off on, on uh, you can even look at it here. When you take off on the 1-6 is out of Sac International, you're going south, you'll be crossing uh, I-5 here, basically is what they're telling you. And the road is like 10 feet. So, a little interesting to put that note in there, but it's there. You see some other ones here at Salinas. Here's takeoff minimums. So runway 8 is standard, which we described what that was, with minimum climb of 243 feet per, for a nautical mile to 800 feet, or you got to have an 1800 foot ceiling and two and a half statute mile visibility for a climb in visual conditions. And here's some departure procedures and more notes that's telling where these obstacles are. So these are takeoff minimums, obstacle, departure procedures, and div diverse vector area. Alrighty, well that, let's see, that pretty much sums it up for, yep, that sums it up for departure and arrival procedures, and uh, we'll see you in the next video.